Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome back to API Days Interface, our annual event about APIs and stuff. My name is Vincenzo Chianese. I work as a software developer for Sentinel One, and I'm going to be the master of the ceremonies. Uh, before we start up with the first speaker, I just want to remind you that the event is going to be today and tomorrow. Be nice on Twitter. You know, make sure that you tweet out the content that we're that we're streaming around, and. Um, also remember that you can ask questions anytime using the chat. I'm going to be monitoring all the time and select the more interesting one. And now without further ado, I'd like to invite on the stage Mike. Hello, Mike. How are you doing today? All right, Vincenzo. How are you? I'm doing fine here from New York, 99 degrees. Oh. Not a very good weather, but you know, no. it is what it is. So what can we do? Uh, yeah. So Mike, uh, well, introducing Mike is just like saying, you know, we breathe air, uh, you know, uh, Mike has been reading a lot of books, working as a consultant for a lot of companies, uh, author of Alps, he's been on the API space for years. So any introduction that I can give you the, the credits that you really deserve. Uh, in, in his presentation that we're just gonna be seeing, Mike is gonna be spinning up a story describing how and what the APIs will look like in not a so distant future. So without further ado, the stage is yours. We're looking forward for your talk. Thank you for being here. Thank being you, us Vincenzo, today. and I'll see you at the Q&A. Okay, so we're going to be talking about APIs of the future and the real question, are you ready? Um, so first of all, just a little bit here, this is me. This is how you can get hold of me on LinkedIn and Twitter and GitHub. And I would love to connect with you. I would love to learn about what you're working on and what kind of projects are interesting for you. So please uh, connect with me, let me know what you're doing and I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, so I have a few books that are actually uh, uh, in circulation right now. So the first one is Design and Build Great Web APIs. The second one is Continuous API Management, which is in early release. So I and some colleagues are doing a second edition. I, if, you're, if you like what you see here today, I encourage you to take a look at those as well. So as I mentioned, we want, I want to talk about APIs of the future. But as typical for me, I don't just want to talk about the future. I also want to talk a little bit about what got us here. So I want to talk about what I call the first and second age of computing. Uh, and I think we're in the second age where we are today. We're maybe have a few more decades and then we will start this, what I call the third age of computing. And that's where we're headed. So that's really kind of what I want to talk about today. So uh, where were we, that first stage of computing? And that dates back all the way to 1850. So 1850 is when we first see the very first computing machines or computing engines, or difference engines, or analytical engines. This is Babbage's analytical engine from around 1850 and uh, 1840. And Babbage uh, had created this machine. It was basically mechanical, pins and gears and levers, and you would program it, a series of these pins and levers, and then when you, when you cranked it, it would actually come up to a new setting, a new set of values. And uh, he wasn't really actually sure what to do with this analytical engine, but there was one person who did, a person by the name of King, who we credit as being the very first programmer. Uh, Augusta King actually figured out how to program this machine to solve a, a series of problems. This is a, the Bernoulli number problem written out in text. And uh, this is really what we call the very first program and the very first programmer. We also know Augusta Ada King, as the Countess of Lovelace, or A.D. Lovelace. So the very first programmer of computers was Ada Lovelace in the mid-1800s, in the uh, late 19th century. She uh, associated it with weavers, looms, the Jacquard loom, which we'll talk about a little bit later. This is a Jacquard loom, which is kind of programmable in a lot of respects. You can actually find many of them today. Um, here's a quote I love uh, from uh, Countess Lovelace. And you can see, even in the very first programming, bug, debugging was still a problem. Uh, I will also point out that Lovelace operated as a remote worker. The machine that Babbage had was uh, in one location, and she wrote, she and Babbage wrote letters back and forth to program it. So there, we share a lot with our very first programming uh, icon. 
Now, I'm going to jump ahead to um, Paul Otley. Paul Otley was born about 20 years after, uh, the, um, uh, after Lovelace had passed away. And he had this vision of using computers not just for mathematical problems, but to actually communicate. This was the early, early part of the 20th century. He wanted to connect sound and audio and video and text. This was his workstation, what he viewed the, the information workstation for what he called the worldwide network would look like. Uh, this is actually the first modern computer we would consider in the, of the modern age computer. This is the ENIAC machine. ENIAC machine actually didn't work on levers and gears, but worked on electrical relays. And you can see these are just rows and rows of electrical relays. In programming, these electrical relays was literally writing a wiring diagram. So now we've gone from writing text in the table to a wiring diagram. And the very first programmers had to actually write out those wiring diagrams. And the very first programmers of this age look identical, really, to the very first programmer of the, of the 19th century. These are the what are referred to as the ENIAC 6, K. McNulty, Bardic, Holberton, and all these others. So literally, the wiring diagrams had to be wired up. They had to be plugged in. That's Holberton in the, in the foreground. I'm not sure that if that's McNulty or Spence in the background. This is how programs were created. And these were the machines that helped us win World War II, actually computed tables for trajectory and things like that. You still needed to be a fantastic mathematician, but you also had to, under, how to understand how to wrangle these big machines. The next big step in computing was the punch card. Punch cards had been around for a while, but they were finally applied to computing. Uh, and NASA was one of the first organizations to use IBM machines to uh, get programmed using cards. And one of the most famous and effective programmers was this woman, Dorothy Vaughn, who was a mathematician and Fortran expert who helped the NASA program actually establish the first IBM 7000 series computer. This is, this is a IBM 700 series. She created the IBM 7000 series teams that actually computed trips for and back to the moon. She, they, she was very important uh, for that. By the way, this is, remember we talked about looms. This is the Jacquard loom. If you look carefully, you can see the Jacquard loom is programmed to create designs by dots in a card. Looks very much like these dots. So this was the reference that Ada Lovelace had made 100 years earlier. We finally have computers that are doing the things that Lovelace had invented. That really is the peak of that first age of computing. The second age of computing really starts around 1950, 1960. But I'm going to jump ahead to this person. This person is uh, Douglas Engelbart. Doug Engelbart is actually uh, changes the course of computing. He thought that technology should uh, not replace but amplify humans, and that by the 20th century, we would have whole computers in our hands. And of course, he was pretty accurate. He created what was called the uh, mother of all demos. He was on stage for 90 minutes. He created the mouse and several other devices to show interactive computing. He showed all of these things, hyperlinking, multi-cursor, point and click, outlines, text messaging, live in video, vision control, and all these other things in 1968. He created even the desk and the, and the chair that he used where it was created specially for him. He established what we have as computing today. And he borrowed a lot of ideas from Ted Nelson for the link on how to, how to uh, connect machines. Ted says we shouldn't impose regularity. We should give people free reign. Ted's vision of computing was connected documents that you could connect in any way you wished. He wrote the book, Computer uh, Lib and Machine Dreams. I encourage you to look at this book. It's a fantastic uh, book. Now, the person who actually made this all work, uh, all of the things that Engelbart and Nelson were talking about, was Wendy Hall, now Dame Wendy Hall. Wendy Hall was charged with turning the Mountbatten archives in the UK into a computer, an online computer system. And using what we now know of as information architecture, created the very first hypertext, hyperlinked multimedia system called Microcosm. And this Microcosm was up and running several years before Tim Berners-Lee had his first version of the World Wide Web working. So we have a lot uh, to thank for uh, Wendy Hall's services. Finally, I'll touch on one more uh, hardware element, and that is Goldberg and Kay's work 
on small talk language, object-oriented programming, and in particular, how to turn that big desktop machine that Hall was using into something smaller that they called a Dynabook, which we eventually recognize as a laptop today. So now we, we can actually program with simple text. By the way, it's hard to see, but this text is a program which computes Bernoulli numbers, just like Ada's program did, and it's written in a language called Ada, named after Countess Lovelace. Uh, now we get to see all sorts of connected documents connected in various ways, and we connect to machines without even thinking about them. And we do most of that through mobile computing devices today. And that really starts to get us close to the pinnacle of the second age of computing. We can compute from anywhere, anytime. Just think about us communing here today in all these different places from around the world, uh, all through this age of computing. So what would the next age of computing look like? What, was, what will we be doing? I can't predict all of the future, but I can tell you some things that I think we will see in the near future that are gonna be very important that you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to. But let's review, let's review. At first, we had written instructions in tables from Countess Lovelace working on mechanical computers. Next, McNulty and her team are working with wiring diagrams for, for electrical relays. Vaughn and her team are working on punch cards for electronic computers. And then finally, Engelbart helps us uh, usher in the area of addressable screens for semiconductors that uh, Hall can use to connect computers all over the world. So from one simple engine to a room full of one machine to a, a computable electric, electronic machine to machines connected all over the world, that's the first two ages of computing. So what's next? Where do we head? Well, let me tell you a few things that I think we're going to be seeing. First of all, I think in the next age of computing, we're gonna be connecting services the way we connect to servers. Today, we don't know what server we're on. We're just connected. We connect to an address and we could be on many servers, different servers all over the world. That's the way services will work in the future. Right now, we have to know the exact address of a service. We have to know all sorts of details about how that service is programmed, its format, whether it's not, whether it's HTTP or MQTT or GraphQL or all these, these things will disappear. We're gonna be programming the actual network instead of a single machine. Today, everything we do when we write programs is based on a single machine, and then we hoist it onto the network. We'll actually program the network. We'll be programming the way AWS runs its services today. And we'll be describing problem spaces, not solution. Every open API document, every RAML document, every SOAP document describes a solution to a problem. Instead, we will be publishing problem spaces like the accounting space, the health space, the insurance space, the banking space. And then people will write their own solutions in shorthand on text in simple form, like the difference between the tables we wrote out by hand and Engelbart's uh, addressable screens. And like I said, machines and endpoints and protocols and formats will all disappear. We won't even know anymore what format or what protocol or what, uh, what endpoint we were talking to. So we'll move from connected machines to connected services. Now, connected services, the diagram on the right is, is actually what's referred to typically as a big ball of mud from lots of services. That will eventually be what all of our services look like across the planet and possibly even across other planets. We will not have this simple straight line diagram. We will have a marketplace just like we have in real life. You'll go to the store and you'll shop for something. You'll ask for a registry of services. You'll pick the service you want. You'll put it in your cart and you'll use it. We'll begin programming languages we, uh, for networks. We already have software-defined networks and things like Ansible and other languages. We'll see more and more languages like that that ignore all sorts of details. You'll actually see, you can see maybe in the bottom box, Siren is a format for a particular uh, interaction for hypermedia. There'll be a Siren language that we'll simply use to do work when we want to. And we'll describe problems like how do I navigate lists and how do I do work in progress management? And we'll describe them in text documents that everyone will be able to use. I'll be doing uh, list navigation and I'll apply that, that uh, challenge to the solution that I want. We'll be able to work at a much higher level. And as I said before, endpoints and protocols and formats will disappear. It may be difficult to read here, but this is actually a short script that uh, loads a configuration, looks in a registry, finds three other services, 
and enlist those three services in filling out a shopping cart for groceries, arranging shipment and payment and ending. And this is written in text, but this could also be done as voice. You can, you can literally say, you know, hello, Joshua, can you please uh, load my groceries and look for shopping and shipping services uh, that will respond. This is not that far off. So how do we prefer, prepare for this kind of future? What can we do? Right now, start looking at low code and automation services. This is the next big pass that's going to start shrinking the distance between a developer and a solution. And it's gonna lower the barrier of entry. People who are more creative, uh, less uh, engineering, uh, will be able to participate and create solutions. We already have some decentralized orchestration in things like IFT and Microsoft Flow and Zapier. Look for more and more of that. Start experimenting today on what those orchestration tools look like because that's what orchestration will look like in the future. You will not be running your own orchestration system. You'll be using a service. And be ready for domain-specific languages to return. Parsons and Fowler wrote a great book in 2010 on it. It may, some parts of it are dated, but I would tell you to go back and look at that book. DevOps has spawned all sorts of domain-specific languages. RPA and low code will start doing more. Think of the language of GDPR, or think of a program language for HIPAA or buy-in banking services or record insurance services or fire uh, health services. You'll be writing in the DSL. You won't need to know about URLs or formats or bodies or queries. You'll simply write in that DSL. And that, uh, this is always a time for me to say, be wary of AI, chatbots, and speech. We still have a long, long way to go. And there are still lots of problems in this area. So be careful. Uh, remember that AI and ML right now just simply pick the most likely choice, not the best choice. And that can end up going very, very badly. Instead, look, uh, get ready for the thing called task-focused microworlds. These are literally DSL-type languages to solve one particular problem. They're not learning machines. They don't have to reason or plan. They just solve a particular fixed problem. We already have some examples of this, like donotpay.com, which is a bot to help you get out of parking tickets. There are lots of health expert services that are helping to analyze documents and find things like cancers and other things that humans might miss. We just saw the launch of GoPilot with GitHub. And now Copilot is basically reading of this whole corpus of material. I'm not sure where they're getting their material. I'm not sure uh, if it's good material. It's uh, Copilot is going to pick the most common answer to the question, not the best answer. You can imagine what, uh, I don't know where they get it, but you can imagine if I created a bot that read all of Stack Flow, Stack Overflow, I might come up with some bad suggestions for how to solve problems. So be very wary of machine learning and AI systems. In fact, if you want to stay informed on this, are, these are two people that I would strongly recommend you keep an eye on. Professor Melanie Mitchell on artificial intelligence. She's written some fantastic books in the area where she focuses on intuition and jokes and irony. And uh, Joy Bolamwinini. Uh, Bol Bolamwinini is uh, famous for this thing called coded bias, which is, uh, which is a... Uh, a video. She's coming out with a book soon. Um, she focuses a lot on the results of depending on machine language and, and artificial intelligence uh, and what that means legally, socially, financially. Uh, so these are two, two people that I would recommend and their colleagues. There are lots of lots of people, but th these are two people that I thought I would shout out right now. Now, finally, I, I'll, I'll just say uh, I showed a few examples of an interactive uh, language, a shell, this is actually a working prototype that I've been working on for the last several months. I call it Hyper or Hyper uh, CLI or Hyperlang. And it is actually an example of how you can start programming in a domain specific language for APIs. So this is actually an API. This uh, goes to a home uh, location, actually searches for a particular user. It edits that particular user and uh, it's done. And you'll see there's only one URL there are no forms, no, no other inputs other than to say that it recognizes forms inside documents. If you're interested, you can visit the, the Hyper uh, uh, repo. We'll be doing lots of more of that in the near future. So again, 
We're going to be programming the network of services with domain-specific languages to enable task-focused bots to operate in problem spaces. Start thinking about that now. We have all of the technical details to do that. Uh, it's a little bit clunky today, just like uh, it's speech is a little clunky, just like machine learning is clunky. But we can still do that today, and we have lots and lots of opportunity ahead of us. Now, I'm just going to mention one more thing. And that is this great quote from Joseph D. Miller, who was introduced to me by David Brin, a science fiction author and futurist. Those who ignore the mistakes of the future are bound to make them. Think about that for a minute. We know that using uh, poor algorithms will result in bias. We know that poor learning data can result in bad outcomes. We know that connecting, uh, forgetting about connecting machines and focusing only on a local machine means things don't scale. We already know these things. Let's not keep making those mistakes. Let's learn from what the future is going to offer us, and then we'll be a lot better off. Now, if some of these things sound interesting to you, uh, I am working on a book for 2022 based on a lot of this material. Uh, for instance, the Hyperlang and the CLI will be in this book. So RESTful Web Microservices Cookbook is a way to start adding all these orchestration and connection and design and information architecture elements together to start talking about how we can apply those lessons of the future today and kind of get ahead of things. So hopefully this has been interesting. Uh, I, peaked, I peaked your thinking. And um, if you're interested, you can follow up with this book. Otherwise, um, the only question now is, are you ready? Are you ready to go out and start trying some of these things? Know where you came from, know where you're going, and now you get a chance to write your own future. So hopefully that helps. I'm gonna go ahead and close out now. I'm gonna switch back to my slides and I hope I get a chance to answer some questions. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for the talk. I, I really like it. Um, we do have some questions here. So um, the first of all, well, I'm gonna say all of them together so you can probably compose a single response. So okay. in your opinion, what is the key piece of technology we're missing right now to make this idea of autonomous API just fly? Second question, who do you think is going in the right direction? And three, out of curiosity, what year do you think we're gonna have the first services that are gonna be working in this way? Oh. This, those, are, those are really, really, really good questions. So um, here's, here's the technology that I think we need next, the most important technology that we're not using. And that is the technology of semantic profiles. We have the actual details uh, in things like RDFS, RDF schema, RDFS OWL for uh, online ontologies for the web, uh, Dublin core application profiles, and a, and a specification I've worked on called application level Profile Semantics, ALPS. Uh, there are a few companies using this right now in their systems. Um, uh, for instance, Pivotal in the Spring Boot series uses them. Um, there are a few other companies, private companies, that use similar ideas. This is the next key. This is built on top of Open API, on top of RAML, on top of uh, Async API. So I think we need a lot of that. That's when we start writing our, our DSLs, our, our languages. I think we need more formats that are more intelligent, like Siren and HAL and Uber and Mason and things like that. Um, but I think this uh, semantic level is, is the next really big one. A company that I would look out for is, and I will tell you that, that I have uh, I've been talking to them. So take this with a grain of salt. And, and that is Superface. Um, and Superface AI, I think it's AI. Um, they are using a very similar uh, technology to make clients malleable. So clients don't break when things like URLs or, or forms or methods or arguments change. So I think there's more of that coming. And then I would tell you that within the next 10 years, we're going to start seeing these kinds of solutions appear. And within the next 20 to 30 years, it's going to be common the way that we think of writing uh, open API or writing HTTP uh, CRUD or REST is common today. That's my prediction. Yeah, uh, I've been luck lucky enough to, to be trying Superface.ai too, and that, that is exactly what I was looking for, like a corroboration of the technology, and I totally agree with you. Okay, I think we're, we're, we're up here, so I want to thank you one more time for joining us. For
with you today and to the audience like mike is going to be hanging out he gave his contact if you have any additional questions he's going to be very very responsive so thank you for being with us today thanks a lot vincenzo and thank you for everyone for attending thank you